This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, Toronto, Ontario, March 2007. This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book One The Romantic Egotist. Chapter One Amori, Son of Beatrice. Part Three The Egotist Down. Amori's two years at St. Regis's, though in turn painful and triumphant, had as little real significance in his own life as the American prep school crushed as it is under the heel of the universities, has to American life in general. We have no Eton to create the self-consciousness of a governing class. We have instead clean, flaccid, and innocuous preparatory schools. He went all wrong at the start, was generally considered both conceited and arrogant, and universally detested. He played football intensely, alternating a reckless brilliancy with a tendency to keep himself as safe from hazard as decency would permit. In a wild panic he backed out of a fight with a boy his own size, to a chorus of scorn, and a week later, in desperation, picked a battle with another boy, very much bigger, from which he emerged badly beaten, but rather proud of himself. He was resentful against all those in authority over him, and this, combined with a lazy indifference toward his work, exasperated every master in school. He grew discouraged and imagined himself a pariah, took to sulking in corners and reading after lights. With the dread of being alone he attached a few friends, but since they were not among the elite of the school, he used them simply as mirrors of himself, audiences before which he might do that posing absolutely essential to him. He was unbearably lonely, desperately unhappy. There were some few grains of comfort, Whenever Amori was submerged, his vanity was the last part to go below the surface, so he could still enjoy a comfortable glow when Wookie Wookie, the deaf old housekeeper, told him that he was the best-looking boy she had ever seen. It had pleased him to be the lightest and youngest man on the first football squad. It pleased him when Dr. Dougal told him at the end of a heated conference that he could, if he wished, get the best marks in school. But Dr. Dougal was wrong. It was temperamentally impossible for Amori to get the best marks in school. Miserable, confined to bounds, unpopular with both faculty and students, that was Amori's first term. But at Christmas he had returned to Minneapolis, tight-lipped and strangely jubilant. Oh, I was sort of fresh at first, he told Frog Parker patronizingly, but I got along fine. Lightest man on the squad. You ought to go away to school, Froggy. It's great stuff incident of the well-meaning professor. On the last night of his first term, Mr. Margerson, the senior master, sent word to study hall that Amori was to come to his room at nine. Amori suspected that advice was forthcoming, but he determined to be courteous, because this Mr. Margerson had been kindly disposed toward him. His summoner received him gravely, and motioned him to a chair. He hemmed several times, and looked consciously kind, as a man will when he knows he's on delicate ground. "'Emory,' he began, "'I've sent for you on a personal matter.' "'Yes, sir. I've noticed you this year, and I—I I like you. I think you have in you the makings of a—a a very good man.' "'Yes, sir,' Emory managed to articulate. He hated having people talk, as if he were an admitted failure. "'But I've noticed,' continued the older man blindly, "'that you're not very popular with the boys.' "'No, sir.' and Maury licked his lips. Ah, I thought you might not understand exactly what it was they, uh, objected to. I'm going to tell you, because I believe, uh, that when a boy knows his difficulties, he's better able to cope with them, to conform to what others expect of him. He ahemmed again with delicate reticence, and continued, They seem to think that you're, uh, rather too fresh. And Maury could stand no more. He rose from his chair, scarcely controlling his voice when he spoke. "'I know. Oh, don't you suppose I know?' His voice rose. "'I know what they think. Do you suppose you have to tell me?' He paused. "'I'm—I've got to go back now. Hope I'm not rude.' He left the room hurriedly, 
in the cold air outside as he walked to his house, he exulted in his refusal to be helped. "'That damn old fool!' he cried wildly. "'As if I didn't know!' He decided, however, that this was a good excuse not to go back to study hall that night, so, comfortably couched up in his room, he munched Nabisco's and finished The White Company. INCIDENT OF THE WONDERFUL GIRL There was a bright star in February. New York burst upon him on Washington's birthday, with the brilliance of a long-anticipated event. His glimpse of it as a vivid whiteness against a deep blue sky had left a picture of splendor that rivaled the dream cities in the Arabian Nights, but this time he saw it by electric light, and romance gleamed from the chariot race sign on Broadway, and from the women's eyes at the Astor, where he and young Paskert from St. Regis's had dinner. When they walked down the aisle of the theatre, greeted by the nervous twanging and discord of untuned violins, and the sensuous heavy fragrance of paint and powder, he moved in a sphere of epicurean delight. Everything enchanted him. The play was The Little Millionaire, with George M. Cohen, and there was one stunning young brunette who made him sit with brimming eyes in the ecstasy of watching her dance. "'Oh, you, wonderful girl, what a wonderful girl you are!' sang the tenor, and Amoria agreed silently, but passionately. "'All your wonderful words thrill me through.' The violin swelled and quavered on the last notes. The girl sank to a crumpled butterfly on the stage. A great burst of clapping filled the house. Oh, to fall in love like that, to the languorous magic melody of such a tune! The last scene was laid on a roof-garden, and the cellos sighed to the musical moon, while light adventure and facile froth-like comedy flitted back and forth in the calcium. And Maury was on fire to be a habitui of roof-gardens, to meet a girl who should look like that, better, that very girl, whose hair would be drenched with golden moonlight, while at his elbow sparkling wine was poured by an unintelligible waiter. When the curtain fell for the last time, he gave such a long sigh that the people in front of him twisted around, and stared, and said loud enough for him to hear, "'What a remarkable-looking boy!' This took his mind off the play, and he wondered if he really did seem handsome to the population of New York. Paskert and he walked in silence toward their hotel. The former was the first to speak. His uncertain fifteen-year-old voice broke in in a melancholy strain on Amori's musings. "'I'd marry that girl to-night.' There was no need to ask what girl he referred to. "'I'd be proud to take her home and introduce her to my people,' continued Paskert. And Maury was distinctly impressed. He wished he had said it instead of Paskert. It sounded so mature. "'I wonder about actresses. Are they all pretty bad?' "'No, sir, not by a darn sight.' said the worldly youth, with emphasis, and I know that girl's as good as gold, I can tell. They wandered on, mixing in the Broadway crowd, dreaming on the music that eddied out of the cafés. New faces flashed on and off like myriad lights, pale or rouged faces, tired yet sustained by a weary excitement. Amori watched them in fascination. He was planning his life. He was going to live in New York, and be known at every restaurant and café, wearing a dress suit, from early evening to early morning, sleeping away the dull hours of the forenoon. Yes, sir, I'd marry that girl to-night. Heroic in general tone. October of his second and last year at St. Regis's was a high point in Amory's memory. The game with Groton was played from three of a snappy, exhilarating afternoon, far into the crisp autumnal twilight, and Amory, at quarterback, exhorting in wild despair, making impossible tackles, calling signals in a voice that had diminished to a hoarse, furious whisper, yet found time to revel in the blood-stained bandage around his head, and the straining, glorious heroism of plunging, crashing bodies and aching limbs. For those minutes courage flowed like wine out of the November dusk, and he was the eternal hero, one with the sea-rover on the prow of an Norse galley, one with Roland and Horatius, Sir Nigel and Ted Coy, scraped and stripped into trim, and then flung by his own will into the breach, beating back the tide, hearing from afar the thunder of cheers, finally bruised and weary, but still elusive, circling an end, twisting, changing pace, straight-arming, falling behind the Groton goal, with two men on his legs, 
in the only touchdown of the game. THE PHILOSOPHY OF THE SLICKER From the scoffing superiority of sixth form year and success, Amori looked back with cynical wonder on his status of the year before. He was changed as completely as Amori Blaine could ever be changed. Amori plus Beatrice plus two years in Minneapolis, these had been his ingredients when he entered St. Regis's, but the Minneapolis years were not a thick enough overlay to conceal the Amori plus Beatrice from the ferreting eyes of a boarding school, so St. Regis's had very painfully drilled Beatrice out of him, and begun to lay down new and more conventional planking on the fundamental Amori. But both St. Regis's and Amori were unconscious of the fact that this fundamental Amori had not in himself changed. Those qualities for which he had suffered, his moodiness, his tendency to pose, his laziness, and his love of playing the fool, were now taken as a matter of course, recognized eccentricities in a star quarterback, a clever actor, and the editor of the St. Regis Tattler. It puzzled him to see impressionable small boys imitating the very vanities that had not long ago been contemptible weaknesses. After the football season he slumped into dreamy content. The night of the pre-holiday dance he slipped away and went early to bed for the pleasure of hearing the violin music cross the grass and come surging in at his window. Many nights he lay there dreaming awake of secret cafés in Montmartre, where ivory women delved in romantic mysteries with diplomats and soldiers of fortune, while orchestras played Hungarian waltzes, and the air was thick and exotic with intrigue and moonlight and adventure. In the spring he read L'Allegro, by request, and was inspired to lyrical outpourings on the subject of Arcady and the pipes of Pan. He moved his bed so that the sun would wake him at dawn, that he might dress and go out to the archaic swing that hung from an apple-tree near the sixth-form house. Seating himself in this he would pump higher and higher, until he got the effect of swinging into the wide air, into a fairyland of piping satyrs and nymphs, with the faces of fair-haired girls he passed in the streets of Eastchester. As the swing reached its highest point, Arcady really lay just over the brow of a certain hill, where the brown road dwindled out of sight in a golden dot. He read voluminously all spring, the beginning of his eighteenth year, The Gentleman from Indiana, The New Arabian Nights, The Morals of Marcus Ordine, The Man Who Was Thursday, which he liked without understanding, Stover at Yale, that became somewhat of a textbook, Dombey and Son, because he thought he really should read better stuff, Robert Chambers, David Graham Phillips, and E. Phillips Oppenheim, complete, and a scattering of Tennyson and Kipling. Of all his classwork, only Le Allegro, and some quality of rigid clarity in solid geometry, stirred his languid interest. As June drew near, he felt the need of conversation to formulate his own ideas, and, to his surprise, found a co-philosopher in Rahill, the president of the sixth form. In many a talk, on the high road, or lying belly down along the edge of the baseball diamond, or late at night with their cigarettes glowing in the dark, they threshed out the questions of school, and there was developed the term, slicker. "'Got tobacco?' whispered Rahill one night, putting his head inside the door five minutes after lights. "'Sure. I'm coming in. Take a couple of pillows and lie in the window seat, why don't you?' and Maury sat up in bed and lit a cigarette, while Rahill settled for a conversation. Rahill's favorite subject was the respective futures of the sixth form, and Amori never tired of outlining them for his benefit. "'Ted Converse? That's easy. He'll fail his exams, tutor all summer at Harstrom's, get into chef with about four conditions, and flunk out in the middle of the freshman year. Then he'll go back west and raise hell for a year or so.' Finally his father will make him go into the paint business. He'll marry and have four sons, all boneheads. He'll always think St. Regis has spoiled him, so he'll send his sons to day school in Portland. He'll die of locomotor ataxia when he's forty-one, and his wife will give a baptizing stand, or whatever you call it, to the Presbyterian Church, with his name on it. Hold up, Amori, that's too darn gloomy. How about yourself? I'm in a superior class. You are, too. We're philosophers." I'm not. Sure you are. You've got a darn good head on you. But Amori knew that nothing in the abstract, no theory or generality, ever moved Rahill until he stubbed his toe upon the concrete minutiae of it. Haven't, insisted Rahill. 
"'I let people impose on me here, and don't get anything out of it. "'I'm the prey of my friends, damn it. "'Do their lessons, get them out of trouble, pay them stupid summer visits, "'and always entertain their kid sisters. "'Keep my temper when they get selfish, "'and then they think they pay me back by voting for me "'and telling me I'm the big man of St. Regis's. "'I want to get where everybody does their own work, "'and I can tell people where to go. "'I'm tired of being nice to every poor fish in school.' "'You're not a slicker,' said Amory suddenly. "'A what? A slicker. What the devil's that? "'Well, it's something that—that—' that... "'There's a lot of them. You're not one, and neither am I, "'though I am more than you are. Who is one? What makes you one?' Amory considered. "'Why—why, why, I suppose that the sign of it is when a fellow slicks his hair back with water. "'Like Carstairs? Yes, sure. He's a slicker.' "'They spent two evenings getting an exact definition.' The slicker was good-looking or clean-looking. He had brains, social brains, that is, and he used all means on the broad path of honesty to get ahead, be popular, admired, and never in trouble. He dressed well, was particularly neat in appearance, and derived his name from the fact that his hair was inevitably worn short, soaked in water or tonic, parted in the middle, and slicked back as the current of fashion dictated. The slickers of that year had adopted tortoiseshell spectacles as badges of their slickerhood, and this made them so easy to recognize that Amory and Rahill never missed one. The slicker seemed distributed through school, always a little wiser and shrewder than his contemporaries, managing some team or other, and keeping his cleverness carefully concealed. Amory found the slicker a most valuable classification until his junior year in college, when the outline became so blurred and indeterminate that it had to be subdivided many times, and became only a quality. Amory's secret ideal had all the slicker qualifications, but, in addition, courage and tremendous brains and talents. Also, Amory conceded him a bizarre streak that was quite irreconcilable to the slicker proper. This was the first real break from the hypocrisy of school tradition. The slicker was a definite element of success, differing intrinsically from the prep school big man. The slicker. 1. Clever sense of social values. 2. Dresses well. Pretends the dress is superficial, but knows that it isn't. 3. Goes into such activities as he can shine in. 4. Gets to college and is, in a worldly way, successful. 5. Hair slicked. The big man. 1. Inclined to stupidity and unconscious of social values. 2. Thinks dress is superficial, and is inclined to be careless about it. 3. Goes out for everything from a sense of duty. 4. Gets to college, and has a problematical future. Feels lost without his circle, and always says that school days were happiest after all. Goes back to school, and makes speeches about what St. Regis's boys are doing. 5. Hair not slicked. Amory had decided definitely on Princeton, even though he would be the only boy entering that year from St. Regis's. Yale had a romance and glamour from the tales of Minneapolis, and St. Regis's men who had been tapped for skull and bones, but Princeton drew him most, with its atmosphere of bright colours and its alluring reputation as the pleasantest country club in America. Dwarfed by the menacing college exams, Amory's school days drifted into the past, Years afterward, when he went back to St. Regis's, he seemed to have forgotten the successes of sixth-form year, and to be able to picture himself only as the unadjustable boy who had hurried down corridors, jeered at by his rabid contemporaries, mad with common sense. End of Book One Chapter One Part Three